put a little love in your heart. <laughs> All right. You know, I was thinking of another song um, yesterday that comes from Mark Miller and uh, I think his first name is Gordon Light, wrote the words. Um, and it's called Draw the Circle. It says, draw the circle, draw the circle wide. No one stands alone, we'll stand side by side. And I do love that song. Because it says to me that no one is outside our circle of care. No one. And our universalist forebears hardwired that understanding into our theology. So tomorrow, you may not know this, but tomorrow is Universalism Day. Did you know that? There is a Universalism Day, and it's tomorrow. So there you go. It is the anniversary of Universalist John Murray's first sermon in North America. And it's the one he preached back in 1770. And now, he was not the first person to preach universalism in the New World, but he was the most noted and the most mythologized, I would say, of all of our universalist forebears. So some of you, long time you use, probably know something of the story of John Murray. Um, he was a Unitarian minister in Ireland until he was convinced to adopt a universalist interpretation of scripture, that Jesus' death and resurrection meant salvation for all people, not just for those who professed the right version of Christianity. Well, soon after his conversion to universalism, which was not looked on well by his Unitarian colleagues, Murray suffered a series of tragedies in his life, and so he decided to give up ministry altogether, sail to New York, and start over. This is where the mythical part of his story begins. The ship went off course, it seems, and ran aground on the New Jersey coast. Murray went ashore with some other folks for supplies and befriended a man there named Thomas Potter. Over dinner at Potter's house, Potter told Murray about the church that, he had, that Potter himself had built on his own property and where he invited universalist-leaning pastors to come and preach. He eagerly asked Murray to preach the following Sunday. But here's the trouble. Murray's ship was set to sail that day, and that was assuming that the wind changed. So Potter said, if the ship can't sail, will you preach? And Murray said, if I'm still here, I'll preach. Well, the wind didn't change, and Murray was there on Sunday, and so he preached. And then the wind changed, <laughs> and he sailed out to New York. Well, the wind was definitely back in Murray's sail. So he traveled and preached after that, preached a universalist message, uh, with the caveat that the unrepentant, the unrepentant dead, did need to spend time in a post-life punishment until the judgment day when all would be saved, all right? So a little caveat, a little twist on universalism, but that was the message back then. Importantly, he founded the first universalist church in the country, and it's in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And he made sure that the church was accepted uh, into the state's parish laws, so it was legal and everybody was happy. He also made way for other universalist ministers who preached a more liberal universalism than he did. One such was Hosea Ballou, uh, whose conversion to universalism happened a couple decades after Murray's. And he believed that salvation was instantaneous, no punishment necessary in the afterlife. He preached, more importantly, that every one of us is a beloved child of God. He preached that every one of us is saved. He preached 
love. As my colleague Kimberly Debus puts it, universalism becomes even more radical when you follow it as we do to its natural conclusion. That if all souls are saved by the simple fact that God loves us, then universal salvation must extend beyond Christianity to literally all souls, whatever they believe. We are inheritors of something incredibly radical, she says. And Reverend Janet Parsons, who currently serves the Gloucester Church that Murray founded over 250 years ago, uh, in a recent sermon, she affirms that love, universal, liberating love, is still at the heart of our Unitarian Universalist theologies. Moreover, she considers love to be our primary religious practice. Now, we UUs aren't known for our religious practices and rituals. We have some though, right? The most common ones I can think of are the gathering of the waters each fall, the flower communion or ceremony, lighting the chalice. But we don't insist that every member and every congregation follow them the same way. Likewise, we also don't have, a conf uh, have everyone confess a particular creed or a set of beliefs. Janet writes, since people don't see us performing a lot of rituals or engaging in religious practices, a lot of people struggle to think of us as religious. And by a lot of people, she means both outside Unitarian Universalism and inside universe, Unitarian Universalism. Anybody here kind of think, well, am I really in a religion? <laughs> I've known people who did. But she says, as Unitarian Universalists, we are called to practice love as our religion and to name this as our practice. Love in the form of compassion for all, and an understanding that all are equally deserving of justice. We draw the circle wide here. If no one is to be left out of heaven, then no one should be left behind here on earth either. We are called to love the hell out of this world. In fact, uh, Reverend Nancy McDonald Ladd suggests that love doesn't care what we believe as individuals. She writes, love cares how we generate life-giving hope in concert with those around us. As we have practiced it in our theological tradition, love is not, ha not now and never has been something that happens in isolation, separate from the sacred push and pull of relationship with each other and with the holy. It is not mine or yours, this love, but ours. And it's our, our spiritual, religious practice. This year, the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations, which includes um, the Napa Valley UUs, voted to adopt new language that describes how we identify ourselves as a religious organization. And in part it says, as Unitarian Universalists, we covenant congregation to congregation and through our association to support and assist one another in our ministries. We draw from our, religious, from our heritages of freedom, reason, hope, and courage, building on the foundation of love. And it goes on to say, love is the power that holds us together and is at the center of our shared values. We are accountable to one another for doing the work of living our shared values through the spiritual discipline of love. Now, if you struggle with considering Unitarian Universalism to be a religion, I invite you to consider that a religion is simply a particular system of faith and worship. It's one definition. As you use, we gather together to worship, meaning to give worth to the good that inspires us, the good we keep faith with, 
the good, uh, the good we keep faith with. And as Reverend Betancourt says, our inherited theological tradition places its faith in love. It doesn't matter if for you, the source of that love is one God or many, or the great universal unfolding, or the essence of humanity. The important thing is that we keep faith with or act out of love. That we continually expand our capacity for compassion. That we stretch understanding of who deserves justice, even when we don't feel it even when there is scant evidence for love's presence. Even then, we try to act as if there is love and goodness at the center and that everyone deserves it. Not only from some supernatural source, but from us, from each of us, so we come together to worship, to remind each other of what we have faith in, of what is most important and worth our time and attention. We come together to remember that love is at the center of our faith and our community. We come together to remember that it is our shared responsibility to bring love where it is needed, to create justice, for, of course, as Cornel West says, justice is what love looks like in public. I don't have to tell you that this world needs more justice to counter the hell here on Earth. There are hellacious situations going on around us at this time. And I named some during our reflection time. And of course, there is this strong political and societal divisions that, that have caused a breakdown of civic discourse, right? And raise fear. Fear as we go about our world, our days, and try to connect with people. Sometimes it's scary to do so. And there are so many horrors and tragedies fueled by the desire for power and wealth and by dehumanizing people, maybe outside our circles, by fear. So how can something as intangible and tender as love be strong enough to conquer hell, to conquer hatred, and to conquer fear? But I ask you, what besides love can do the job? For to my mind, love is the fuel each of us needs to bring more compassion and justice to this world. So what does love call us to do? How do we love the hell out of this world? It doesn't mean utter selflessness or giving ourselves away to those who don't recognize our humanity or who constantly hurt us, for we are also deserving of loving kindness. But it does mean extending ourselves as much as we can, both within and without. For me, that it means examining my own prejudices and xenophobia. It means practicing listening with as much of an open heart as I can muster so that I can recognize the perspectives of humanity of others, uh, perspective and humanity of others, and expand my ability to respond with compassion. Um, there's a, a, an amazing um, activist for civil rights and reproductive rights named Loretta J. Ross. Um, she is a champion of something that she calls calling in culture. Right now there's, you know, we see so often people calling others out or, um, you know, there's the whole cancel culture going on, right? Where if, you, if somebody does something that's, um, that is offensive or problematic, people jump on them and 
shame them and blame them and in without much kindness right without much hope for redemption or reconciliation and sometimes calling out problems in this world are necessary but the piling on and the way that we ostracize people maybe not so much so helpful and maybe haven't we all done something at some point in our lives that could be called out and be painful so her idea is that we need to call people in call people into conversation and this is not a simple matter she points out that that we need to prepare ourselves in order to be able to call someone in to conversation it means being prepared to respond to the person with respect. I respect you, I see you, I see that you are a human being. This happened, you know, why did you come to that conclusion? Tell me what your thought process was. Let's talk about what is going on, tell me more. She says it's a matter of offering loving attention. With, um, with that, you're inviting them into a conversation instead of a fight. You don't have to agree with somebody. All you're doing is admitting to the possibility that they are as complicated as you are. And everybody deserves to be heard and respected. So again, this requires a lot of inner work. And we, we're not always ready to do this. I mean, it's a big thing to engage in that conversation. And we have to monitor our own anxiety and our own fears. So a breathing exercise like we did during the reflection can be helpful, something to help calm the body and allow us to be present. But I think, I think it's important to try this. And uh, Ross says that um, a friend of hers says that calling in will be to the civil rights movement of the 21st century what nonviolence was in the 20th century. Something to think about. That makes it pretty revolutionary, doesn't it? Now, we won't always get a dramatic conversion of the other person, right? In my experience, sometimes the calling in conversation doesn't get the person to change their point of view at all. But if I do it right, we both feel heard and we can part on good terms so that maybe we can have another conversation. Sometimes love calls us to take to the streets um, for a cause, like today's uh, uh, Napa Day Against Hate event over in Westwood Hills Park, and I'm glad some of you will be there. Sometimes love calls on us to call on others to do better in no uncertain terms. Sometimes love means getting out the vote, collecting food for the food bank, or caring for someone in need, including ourselves. Maybe that's the most, the best way to practice love in the moment. However we practice love, let us reaffirm our commitment to that practice that uses love's tender and supple power to drive out hate. For only love can do that. Let us expand our circle of care ever wider until no one is outside. And let us keep faith with each other that this is possible if we work for it. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>